this is a topic that I think that's controversial in, in our world because Huge. we have TikTok we have TikTok educated people who think that they're doctors, that they're they're actually <laughs> high school dropouts who who read too many articles. <laughs> I created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. to another exciting episode of Guru Talk. I'm Dave Palumbo, and I'm joined again by popular demand, a good friend, Don Butasio, Super Sliced, and Dr. John Pierce. Uh, we did a show on testosterone a, uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago now, and uh, a lot of people want to see more and hear more. So we got him back here. Guys, welcome back to the show, and thanks for taking time. Thanks for, thanks having, for having us. So yeah. I'm just going to really start with laughing because the last time we did a show, Dominic had some issues with people doing yard work outside of his house. And now we're both in the same freaking office and we're getting our roof redone. And I think these guys would take off for lunch and they're jumping around like they're on a freaking ah, trip. Shit, on so, <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Um, you know, testosterone, you know, and testosterone replacement, testosterone uses for bodybuilding. I've been, I mean, that's all the questions. I mean, probably 50% of the questions I get are about that. And I think that I'd like you to make a distinction, um, Dr. Pierce, between pharmacological. Oh. I think I have lost him. And, you know, how do you decipher between them? So uh, you froze for a second, but I, I have an idea that you're asking the difference between you know, what we use it for in the medical side of it versus kind of what people are using it for uh, in bodybuilding and, right. and, you know, kind of the, the black market world. And so, um, you know, for for us, we're, we're trying to maintain testosterone levels within physiologic ranges. And then it really depends on the provider that you go to, whether or not they want you to be at the upper end of that range or just peeking over the the lower end of the normal range. And, um, you know, so that therein lies the difference. I, I, I go to a lot of conferences um, and I hear differences of opinion. And it just seems to me um, that your endocrinologist, urologist, internal medicine docs, and I'm not speaking for all of them, but they're the ones that are basically, well, the low, you know, the low testosterone is diagnosed uh, when the level is under 300 on two separate tests, the labs have to be drawn before 9 a.m. in the morning, um, and, and, and they need to be 24 hours apart. And if both of those tests have a level of under 300, then and only then will they consider your symptomology and then begin treatment. And then if they get your level to 450, 500, and you were at 300, they go, well, you know, that's one hell of an improvement. You're no longer low testosterone. They're not looking at free testosterone levels. Um, they're patting themselves on the back because they look, look, I fixed you, and most patients feel no different. Um, at, but they can build the insurance company. They can show the, the level of improvement, and, and we've addressed the low testosterone. And when I go to those conferences and I hear those guys, and they, you know, they make fun of uh, what, what we do here, treating at the upper end of the limit. They're like, well, those are the feel-good doctors. And, you know, that's not good. <laughs> And I, I wonder, I'm like, well, so don't patients want to feel better or do they right. just want their numbers to look better on a piece of paper? Right. Um, right. So, well, you know, but again, the, the idea, regardless of either, either side of it, cause I focus more on the patient, but it's trying to get to a level within the normal quote unquote, normal range. The problem is 
that that normal range uh, when I first started was around 1100 and they've dropped it down to below a thousand. It's like right night, nine fifty or so. Right. How is, you know, how's the level dropped 150 points? And that's quote unquote normal. So yeah. I kind of look for, and honestly, I just kind of throw totals out. I'm really focused on free testosterone and mostly on, on the response of the patient. Now that, right. you know, in a nutshell, what we're doing on our side Versus in the bodybuilding world, um, you know, there's a dose response curve. So the more you do to a certain level, you're going to get more and more benefits, right. especially when it comes to hypertrophy and, and, you know, body composition, strength, recovery, things of that nature. They, but it gets to a point and then it, it kind of levels off and may even drop off. So I think, um, you know, when you go outside the physiologic range, that kind of changes things because we have a finite amount of testosterone receptors. And in the physiologic range, the body will maintain those receptors and utilization of them. When you go super physiologic, the body can't lower that testosterone level to the <clears throat> range. It's doing everything it can, shutting down your production, shutting down the HPDA access, doing all of that. It's not able to do it. So then it starts to, starts to downregulate receptors. And now it does, if you don't have you know, the lock for the key to go into, it doesn't matter how much testosterone is yeah. in yeah. And so I, that's where the cycling and stuff like that yeah. comes from. I I'm, I'm going to come back to that receptor thing because this, this is a topic that I think that's controversial in, in our world because we have, TikTok, we have TikTok educated people who think that they're doctors, that they're, <laughs> they're actually high school dropouts who, who've read too many articles. But Dom, what do you, would you say would be the the upper level that you find ideal for like bodybuilders doing like, you know, pharmacological dosages to get muscle gains. So, I mean, I've seen people take it from anywhere from 500 milligrams a week up to 1200 milligrams a week. But I think what the main problem is, especially nowadays, I feel like Dave, like probably when you started bodybuilding, I did, we didn't see this as much, but I see a lot of, younger men and women too that are just getting into bodybuilding and they're in their early 20s and they're staying on they're staying on testosterone all the time and then when i sit down with them and i ask them i talk to them is fertility a priority for you at all in the future you know it probably might not be right now but could it potentially be in 10 or 15 years from now and they're like yeah you know potentially and I would ask them then, you know, why are you staying on all the time? In my history, what I've noticed, and I think you could agree to this, anytime someone touches a performance enhancing drug for the first time, chances are their response is going to be incredible that first time. Right. And then as years go on, their bodies no longer respond the same way that they do. And to me, there are benefits to people coming off when they are running these crazy non-physiological ranges of hormones because when they do come off a good analogy that I'll give to is like the whole fasting trend when they talk about autophagy. Well, when you come off of testosterone, you're essentially starving your androgen receptors. That's why you feel like crap. Even if your ranges go back to a physiological range, you're used to being up here. So just being down here, you're going to feel like crap. And during that time frame, what I've seen, there's a lot of different things you can do. And that's why I call it like a, a recomposition phase where you use a phase where you have to back off of all the stuff that you're taking to kind of go ahead, work on resensitizing the androgen receptors during that time with your training, you're more so focused on holding on to the muscle you put on. You're not trying to build a ton of muscle because your hormones are taking a pretty significant dip. Um, but it's it's all designed for the future to benefit you so your body responds once you go back on if you just stay on you know all the time then you're not going to get the same response the whole consensus is that you want to try to mimic that response that you had the first time that you went on of course it will never be the exact same but you, there is a place where you can kind of resensitize your androgen receptors and that's when i think it's good to do that in bodybuilding now everyone's case is totally different. Like if it's someone in their late forties and you know, their endocrine systems already ran into the gutter, that's a totally different story if they already have kids. But 
I'm talking about a lot of these newer guys that are kids in their early 20s. Um, I had a guy last week, he's 25 years old. He's been on hormone replacement therapy since he's 21 years old. And, you know, he didn't know anything about that, you know, when you're taking exogenous testosterone, it's shutting your hypothalamus and pituitary are pretty much essentially signaling off your natural hormone production. And people need to know this, that, you know, there's benefits to coming off on a bodybuilding standpoint, but to Dr. Pierce's side, it's different because he is trying to just get people into physiological hormonal ranges for health and overall well-being. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, you, 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 we're on the same page here. So <laughs> there's not going to be any debate on this one, but. But there's you know, some coaches I, that are, don't believe that. that you know, I know, I'm going to bring, bring that up. There's some, some of these, these, these younger guys that are preaching to the TikTok audience are, are they're quoting some study that it, it, I saw the study. It's ludicrous about how the more testosterone you take, the, the more receptive the androgens get. But the study really deals with people who have never taken. It's like one testosterone shot they've given these people. They're borderline like obese already. They don't have any activity. And they found that if they give them one shot of testosterone and they feed them a little more, that they actually have an uptick in androgen receptor sensitivity because – but they, these are not people that have been on testosterone. So they're, they're taking a study that's not relevant and applying it to guys that are on, you know, 1,200 milligrams of testosterone a week for, you know, for eight months. And they're, and they're trying to say, well, if they stay, take more testosterone, their androgen receptors will become, become more sensitive, which we know is, is ludicrous. I mean, that the fact that anyone would even suggest that. Because well, it's who's, the most, like who's got the best sensitivity of anyone? Women. The reason why women's androgen yeah. receptors are so good is because they have no testosterone in their body. They have tiny amounts. They have no You want to speak to that, Dr. Pierce? No, I was just, you know, just to kind of go to that point of that study. I mean, you, if you got people that have low androgen levels, mm -hmm. I mean, their body is trying to utilize every last bit that, that it can. So those there's going to be an uptick in them and their androgen receptors to begin with. And then you start to give them some androgens, and it's 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 like water in the desert yeah exactly you get a little you get a little bit of water and the flowers bloom all over the place right but right. if it keeps raining <laughs> yeah they, they don't continue to bloom all no. over the, you know they, they end up drowning right yeah. so you know that, that does make 100 percent sense the way you you've uh, formatted that so plus i mean like i said women are you know, women can take anivar and they get a really good muscle building response because their androgen receptors are so sensitive so dom to, to what you said earlier first of all i feel the sweet spot for the high level of testosterone is about like you said about a thousand to twelve hundred milligrams i think people get ideal results with the least amount of side effects i think more than that is waste to be honest with you but i mean that's i think, that's even more, I think more than 750 or 800 is kind of a waste I haven't noticed any, the only difference that you'll notice, I tell people, and this isn't just with testosterone, this is with other like performance enhancing drugs too. Yeah. That the only thing that really changes is the level of side effects that are going to be yielded by increasing the dose that high. I always found about a thousand was ideal for me, but um, you know, everyone's a little different. But you know, the funny thing is if I take a hundred milligrams of HRT, my levels go to 1200. I'm the same way. People that are on 400 milligrams per week of testosterone, and they can't even get to 850. Why is that, Doctor Pierce? Well, you know, first off, I wanted to ask because you guys, you know, are in a unique situation. Mm -hmm. So those folks that you have worked with that are using 500 to 1,000 milligrams of testosterone, has anybody ever gotten a level on them? Because I've seen some of those levels at five and six thousand. I just yeah. wondering, you know, yeah, is that what they are? Thing? Okay. Um, now to the second part of it, you know, everybody's different. Everybody's physiology is different. And this, you know, I told Dom this, um, it, it's just my observation and you probably fall into this too, Dave, but I, I find that primarily Italian descent men that are <laughs> under five foot, you know, 10 inches yeah. have this, like it's almost like you, I can wave a bottle of testosterone underneath your nose, and the level <laughs> goes up and stays there. Um, and and it's almost like the the body doesn't reuptake the testosterone. So the little bit that you put in your system stays there, which is great. And it, right. and, and, and it, you get all the anabolic effects from that testosterone. I've got a handful of patients that fit that perfectly. And one of the guys I've known long before I was a doc, when I started seeing him as a patient. 
I give him a little bit and he's, and we look at his levels and he's like, I swear to God, I'm doing what you're telling me. I'm not doing anymore. I'm like, yeah, I believe you. And you right. have no reason to lie to me. We've been friends for way too long. And I, it's just something that we laugh at every time because his levels on the smallest amount are great versus, you know, somebody else. I've got some patients that are on literally 300 milligrams twice a week and oh they're in God. the physiologic range, <laughs> right? So well, why is that though? What, what's going so, on? Yeah. So there are, are people that are, you know, hyper responders and people that aren't. And so what ends up happening is that you're either burning through it, your body's utilizing it, or you're excreting it. Mm. And that's basically, that's the only two things that could happen. Right. right? So for people that, that, you know, have higher levels, a little bit of testosterone, it stays in the body. Why? It's almost like there's, there's, I use it uh, neuron type physio or thought process. It's almost like there's no reuptake. So you just, your body's not pulling it in and, right. and, you know, burning it. It's just kind of just sitting there, getting in and doing what it's supposed to do as opposed to excreting it. Right. Mm. So that, then, that's kind of what I found. And it just really, there's no way to test anybody for this. And you just got to kind of start for me. I use a standardized dose and then base it off of, you know, labs and how they feel, whether or not we, we do anything. And for most of the time, I, I very rarely have to reduce the dose. Most of the do, time, my standardized dosing is, is spot on. Do you think that that has something to do? Like when I, I know Dom was a real good athlete in, in, when he was in high school and stuff like that. So, I mean, I was like super aggressive. Like I probably had super high testosterone, I think. Now, did I have high testosterone or did I just respond better to what I produced? That, that's the question, you know. Well, I think it's a little of both, right? Because what you produce probably stayed in your system a lot longer. Right. Right. So it's, interesting. it's an interesting concept that people haven't really explored, you know? Yeah. And, I, and I, this is just an observation. So I don't know that, you know, that there's any science to validate what I'm saying, but you know, that, that's kind of my observation. It makes sense. It makes sense because it would explain why the, the huge variability. I know guys on HRT and they, and they have no sex drive. I'm like, are you serious? Yeah. I have a theory yeah. on, on that as well. Right? What is it? <laughs> so you're familiar with testing in sport where there's a T to E ratio, right? Right. What is that E? Epi testosterone. Correct. I've never seen a lab that tests for epi testosterone. Right. When I look at uh, the steroidal genesis pathway, I don't see epi testosterone in that. I see right. DHEA, Anderson Dion testosterone. Right. Where the hell is this epi testosterone? Where is it made? I don't know. So I think epi testosterone is substance X. And okay. here's why it's important. Because we can look at that ratio and determine is somebody on, you know, supplemental testosterone or is this their natural production? Right. right? So when we're on supplemental testosterone, what happens to our natural production? It goes down. Right. And over duration then it, it, you know, you, get, you have the testicles turned off for a much longer period of time. And mm. so you're getting less, and I'm going to just use epitestosterone because this is my theory, yeah. you're getting less epitestosterone. I think epitestosterone has an effect in the brain and in libido, and we know estradiol does as well, but right. I think that epitestosterone has some effect. And here's why I think that and kind of mm. validate it, because when I have patients in that situation, I give them HCG. Right. Bang. Their libido comes back. Everything's mm. working great. Why? The HCG is mimicking luteinizing hormones, stimulating the cells in the testicles to start making endogenous testosterone and some epitestosterone. This is my theory. Uh, it's possible. You know, it would be interesting if, if some of these compounding pharmacies started making epitestosterone and you kind of provide like mm -hmm. maybe a ratio like of 100 milligrams of testosterone a week to 50 milligrams of epitestosterone a week and see how people respond to that. It might be it because you're right. It's obviously there for a reason. Right? right, it's not there for nothing. It's not there so we can drug test people to see if their their, their ratio is off. It's there. Yeah, for, it was. Yeah. yeah, our bodies made it for the International Olympic Committees. <laughs> it's there for some it. reason. Yeah, <laughs> we don't know what it is. Yeah, hundred percent. Here's and, I have a I have a good question that um I've been seeing a lot like with a lot of these the TikTok type coaches and very popular on social media, and it's something that I've seen for years. And Dr. Pierce, no one has more experience than you. What would you say is the highest um, nanograms per deciliter um, total testosterone range for a woman to be at before they would see any like uh, fertilization type of side effects? Um, 
because to my knowledge, I've seen someone on the social media that was preaching, oh, you know, if it's anything, you know, if their total is any 80, uh, anything higher than 80 or 100 nanograms per deciliter, they're going to start to see those side effects, which, I mean, I've been prepping top level competitors that are women for years. And I've seen them, to me, as long as they're usually not anything higher than around 300, I don't see any of those side effects. Um, but I mean, you've literally worked with thousands. So I wanted to see what your input was on that. Well, as in medicine, it all depends. So everybody's an individual. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so let's just talk about some of the numbers. Um, so to your point, Dom, there was a study that I read, God, some years ago, and I think I, I have it in one of my lectures, but it was basically looking at voice change in women and using that is kind of the barometer. And they were not seeing any issues until the serum level went to 450 nanograms per deciliter. That's exactly what I would think. Right. Now, there's uh, a breast oncologic surgeon who's written papers on her utilization of testosterone to prevent the reoccurrence of breast cancer. And the average level for her patients, it was around 196 nanograms per milliliter, okay? And, very, and in her papers, very few had any androgenic or virilization effects um, with that testosterone, and some did. Um, now, when, when you look at the upper end of the normal range for a menopausal woman, the range is zero to 50. So zero is normal in that, and so is 50. With a younger woman who's menstruating normally, athlete, et cetera, the upper end of normal is about 100. So, you know, and it, so the average is roughly one-tenth of what a normal male's testosterone would be, right? And so I think under 100, you're probably pretty good. And then from there, it really depends on the individual. So, you know, depending on what you're looking to do, I mean, somebody, I actually heard somebody, and it might have been the same person on a podcast, saying it's ludicrous for them to be over, you know, 100. Well, go tell that to the breast oncologic surgeon because, She's preventing breast cancer. And if you think that's ludicrous, I think you need your head examined, right? Um, so, you know, you got to really understand what the goal is for the patient. And if, if you listen to the same podcast I did, the guy was like, well, you know, then, you know, these women, of course, testosterone's addictive. And eh, I don't like that term, but, you know, women do feel better. He goes, oh, so they're going to chase that. Well, not like necessarily because not everybody wants to sacrifice some of those virilization effects. So Let, I have a question and I, and I, and I posed this a million times to um, different, a lot of different podcasts. And since you, this is your business, I'd like to ask you this. Why is it that we don't have an approved protocol for women who have low sex drive, who maybe don't have enough, who've lost muscle, all the things that you would give testosterone, like a very low dose testosterone for, why don't they just put them on Anivar? Anivar solves all those problems. It's, it's anabolic. It gives them a better sex drive. It has no side effects because the, the androgenic component of it is very, very low. Is it a stigma thing or, or is it just that they don't can't think outside the box? Because I always recommend when I send women to HRT clinics, I'm like, ask them for Anivar. And you know what? That, that's the best solution for them. I, I, I absolutely agree with you. But now I, got the, I have the answer for that. What? The FDA's just took it off of the pharmacopoeia. You can no longer get it in the United States. Really? Absolutely. Yeah, you didn't know that. No, well, yeah. no, I, I, there are still clinics prescribing it, so I don't know how yeah, to do but, it. But, but you know, their like, compound pharmacies still have some. Pharmacies, what they what they uh, have in their inventory. This is my understanding. Right. And once it's gone, it's gone because you won't be able to get it. Wow. So, that's, so that's the easy answer for that. You no, know, but you know, listen. It, it, you think they would actually leave? The thing is, the best drug for women on the market, and they and they <laughs> pulling and they're pulling it. I do exactly. remember when they. I do remember reporting that. I didn't think they went through. I thought they were debating they were doing that. I think that that's gone through. Yeah. I don't think, according to Rick Collins, it, it, it has gone through. But but because I don't okay. see how these clinics would be getting it still otherwise. But Yeah, I, but I know that we've been um, – we have a very hard time getting it. So the places that we were getting uh, it from really? are no longer – yeah. So. But why wouldn't guys like, you know, yourself and the people who kind of run these anti-aging organizations suggest that that – you know, make that part of the protocol? I mean, just like – they added HCG to the testosterone replacement protocol with a little Arimidex if some of them, you know, prescribed. 
why can't this why can't they make up a woman's protocol that doesn't involve testosterone which we know at a certain point and in some women are more sensitive than others does cause virilization i know if i'm a woman i don't want my voice changing i don't want to grow hair on my face but that's the point though of coming into a clinic like the way dr pierce does stuff it's not like these telemedicine places where you do an online appointment here take this cookie cutter protocol and see you later no he starts them off at a very low baseline which it could be anything from five or 10 milligrams a week, whatever he deems that's necessary. Right. But then he has them come back about a month later and sees where they're at. And then he could titrate the dose like accordingly from there. And I'll tell you even, right. I mean, Dave, you know this too, like from working with women, um, the dose is really in the, uh, meant the poison's really in the uh, duration and the dose. Like they could walk around with a, total test level of 1200 if it's not more than three weeks they're not going to have any irreversible side effects right right if they help yeah you know so you know in in our world in in kind of the the wellness i don't like the term anti-aging because we're all aging it's just trying to be the best that you can be at, at whatever age you are um but um you know we're we're not we're not the endocrine society we're not the urologic society we're not the gyn society so they look down upon us and that's just kind of them sitting in their ivory towers you know throwing stones and and you know for all intents and purposes they can do that so basically what we do um they look at is oh that, that absolutely it must be wrong if you're doing it and it, it's just kind of that uh they're mightier than thou thinking. Um, so, you know, yeah, I've used oxandrolone in women um, for, you know, to prevent sarcopenia because they go on these very low caloric diets and, you know, right. we want to make sure they're, you know, maintaining lean muscle mass and it's hard for them to get enough protein. And so oxandrolone was great for that. Um, you know, another, another hormone or uh, steroid that, that I've seen and I've used mm -hmm very sparingly, but nandrolone decanate uh, in yeah. women doesn't seem to have virilization effects. They feel pretty good on it. And I use it a lot, uh, well, relatively for men with joint issues. And there's joints, good, yeah. good papers on, you know, it's it helping with osteoarthritis pain and, and things of that nature. So, uh, and you don't need it for very long. You can right. you know, use it for eight, 10 weeks, right. once or twice a year. And it, it seems to have long, long effects. Yeah, very good for joint. Like, especially if you're recovering from a surgery and you have a lot of, art, uh, um, excuse me, a lot of tendonitis, it seems to really help with that a lot. Yes, sir. But all right, so let me let me just ask you. Now, let's switch gears because I know we we have a limited amount of time. You know, you have another. You have a very interesting test that you're doing. Dom told me about, and obviously, my my mother and my whole mother's side of the family, everyone died of cancer. Everyone, not not there's not one person that didn't. It's it's yeah. unbelievable. So it's obviously as as a person who has fifty percent of those genes, it it and, and I actually had thyroid cancer already. It 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 makes me nervous. Now there's a test out now that Don was telling me about. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about it that can help detect early cancer before you even almost have it. Explain yeah, what it's about. It's pretty daggum amazing. So uh, there was a Peter Atia did a podcast on one of the. The founders of the company and, and it was kind of it's called liquid biopsies uh on, on his podcast the drive if somebody wants to look that up and really get in depth with it because it's 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 really intense however uh the long and short of it is uh this grail galari test uh looks at 50 plus different types of cancers what it's looking at is is cancer dna so as a tumor develops a healthy immune system will attack it and destroy it but when it, it when it continues to grow, you have a growth and death rate. And as as the body's destroying those cells, that releases DNA into the serum, and that's what this test is detecting is that DNA. And then their database, once it finds that DNA, it, it, it's almost like a fingerprint. And it can say this is the area that we suspect the cancer's in, and then you can start do imaging or or whatever right. needs to be done to kind of follow it up. And so you, you start to think about it. You go, well, what are the risk factors for cancer? And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously smoking and diabetes, and those are the easy ones that come to mind. But if you look at the incidence of cancer below the age of 50 is, is not so frequent. And as soon as you hit 50, it kind of goes to 24%, you know, from 45 to 55. 
And then from 55 to 65, it's 25 percent. And, you know, and, and then it drops down from 65 to 70. So, you know, that that basically or 65 to 75, but 60 percent plus of all cancers mm-hmm. happen between the age of 45 to 75 in those 30 years. So really, you know, you kind of cut it down to 20 and you go 50 to 70. That's kind of the window. So I think, you know, anybody that hits the age of 50 and you don't even need a a strong family history, I would get this test because it does a really good job at looking for a lot of cancers that we don't already screen for. That's not very good at finding cervical cancer if you're a female, but that is a test that gets screened for annually if you do your OBGYN pap smear. Right. It's not very good. Um, with a particular type of breast cancer, but if you do your own <coughs> self-screening, it has that you know you can find a tumor relatively early. Uh, it's not good for renal cancer, which unfortunately there is no self-screening for that. Right. Not very good for thyroid cancer because the the, the, the renal the, the kidneys are kind of they're retroperitoneal. They're in a their own encasement. So that, that doesn't get into the blood. Um, gotcha. the, the thyroid is kind of encased itself. Um, so thyroid, you can see the thyroid with the, with the ultrasound. That's pretty simple. Yeah. Right, and it, or a good physical exam. And then yeah. uh, it's not really good uh, for uh, prostate cancer, again, because it's it's encapsulated. But, you know, the, a ton of other cancers, head and neck cancer. This is it right here. Colon cancer. There you go. Yeah. So... Um, you know, it's more than it's over, it's over 50 different types of cancer. And the best part about it is it can detect it before it's even the size of a grain of uh, sand. Before is there a, any false positives on that? That, that would make me a nervous wreck, you know? No, there, they, no? It, they, they, there's, there are some false positives. And I forget what the rate, I want to say it's about 2%. It's 99%. Yeah. So wow. the, the, the positive side of it, it's, it's what pretty, about like pancreatic liver, you know, call everything. Those, yeah. are the main, those are the most deadly ones, you know, so those, uh, those are the ones you want. Everything. To I mean, pretty much if, if, if you're over 50 and if you yeah. have a, any family history of cancer, you're an idiot. If you don't get this done, I guess but, I'm an idiot. So I guess I should get it done. You are getting it done when I'm you come so, out here for the, I know, so, to be honest with you, I'm so scared to get it done because if God forbid it comes back positive, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. Dave, you sound like half the bodybuilders I work with that won't even go to get their blood work done. I, well, on. you know why? Because I have cancer in my family. That's why, you know, yeah, but no, bur- I, I'm, burying your head in the sand doesn't help. No, I know. I know. I believe I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm saying that because I know everyone's thinking the same thing I am. Like, do I want to find out? But I get now. Let's say, let's yeah, say, early. Right? The let's earlier, say, right, let's say they said it came back positive for like pancreatic cancer, which is what my mother had, which right. I'm not putting that on myself. I'm just saying it. Right. Okay. Um, so what do they do now? What's the next? What do they do? Imaging. They, 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 they test you instantly. Imaging. So Imaging. You, you go, yeah, you go get a, a CT. Well, what if it's so small you can't even see the an, an image of it? Perfect. Then they repeat the test because so we're not seeing it. We repeat. <laughs> so I got. So I got to wait. I got. I know I got cancer. My my in my but body. You don't know. Like, because because the, there is the possibility of false positive, right? Right. And then the the company will repeat the test. Okay. Again, okay. The company will repeat. repeat. That's yeah, good. They're, they're, yeah. I've I've really sat down with their science, chief okay. science officer and I talked to them about that. Once you kind of make the investment into your own health and try to right. figure this stuff out, they're mm-hmm. not in it just to get your money and go. If it's negative, right. you're good. If it's not, man, they've got a team. And then they right. are working here locally, I know, with the oncology groups. Right. So if you don't have – they're like, hey, we've explained this test to the oncologist. Sure. We're going to get you in to see the oncologist. And you know, so we're going to let the oncologist work with you, do right. the imaging. They're going to start working with the company and, and so mm-hmm. – you're in the pipeline. Gotcha. They, were just, they were just telling me like they had a. I don't want to join the pipeline. I'm hoping I'm not going to be in the pipeline. But yeah, what I'm saying is, yeah, don't be afraid was what you're saying because if there is a false positive, they're going to retest you anyway to make sure it was correct. Okay. And the and and the the follow up test from speaking because Dr. Pierce and I met with the lady from the actual company. Yeah. Uh, the follow up test is for free too. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when they repeat it. Absolutely. So what is what is a typical cost for something like this to, to get tested? Eleven forty nine. Yeah. And I will tell you, like to be honest, and this was Dr. Yeah. Pierce's decision. Right. We here at the clinic really make absolutely nothing off this. And when we had this meeting about it, gotcha. Dr. Pierce is like, listen, this is not something he's like, I just want to be able to offer this here. I see what you're saying. It's like Except a separate ourselves from other places that don't, because right. when you read, go online, you look look this up and you read the testimonials of this, 
this has saved so many lives. So I'm the sure. way that we look at it is if we could provide, you know, better healthcare for people and we're helping essentially save people's lives, they're going to put their trust in us for other things too as well. Right. Right. Well, I think it's a great service you do. When I come out there for the Olympia War before that, I'm going to come. He is you. doing this. You yeah. are doing it when I you come I'm out. Gonna do it. I'm going to do it. So you just Only have, two have, a blood. have a test ready for me. I'll be, I'll be, what do you do? You take blood or you swab two, your cheek? Or... No, no, two, two tubes of blood. I okay. did it. Uh, and it takes, let's see, I just got my results last week. It takes uh, a week well, or two to get your results back. No, it takes a week. Yeah. Cause I did my, I did my test Monday or Tuesday last week and I got my results yesterday. I'm assuming they're clear. Yeah, they were. They were. I was. I was. I was. You know, teasing my staff. I was like, you know, because maybe they'd be nicer to me if it was positive. But they were like, no, get ready for your next patient. It's none of them, right? <laughs> now, would I now see, seeing that I had thyroid cancer at some point and, and I had some metastasis of it, you know, and I had I radioactive iodine. Would that throw this test off? Would there, would there be cells that would come up for that possibly in my bloodstream? It, it, that's a great question. I don't have the answer. That would be something that I. You know what? I'm going to. Maybe ask. get a hold of that that uh, yeah. chief medical officer and ask. Um, I, but because it it's it's not very sensitive for thyroid, it doesn't even pick up thyroid cancer. So well, it doesn't I, because like, the thyroid is encapsulated. But if my cells are maybe you know, in the I, past, yeah. I, so if it does come up, that would be that would be pretty interesting. So this is yeah, yeah. going to be one that I will get an answer for you. Okay, all right. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming on. The topic was super interesting. I love the fact that you know we we're talking about stuff. And trying to dispel a lot of these rumors that are floating around all the social media because I hear the craziest shit about you know why you shouldn't go off and you take more testosterone and it, it I mean it doesn't take a brain surgeon if you have an ounce of logic in your brain less you come off you resensitize androgen receptors and you know if you stay on they don't get sensitized and just to, another point I wanted to point out you know I took anabolics for 13 years I did HRT for 10 years after that. And I still was able to get, you know, uh, my wife pregnant with three kids. So uh, I, I don't think necessarily the idea of being on, a, on, on, you know, anabolics or testosterone is going to make you infertile permanently. I think you're definitely infertile while you're on it, kind of like the way a woman would be infertile when she's on birth control pills. It seems like there's a good resiliency to the, uh, to the uh, testosterone hypothalamus um, pituitary axis. Would you agree with that, Dr. Pierce? A hundred percent. I mean, you're going to always have outliers, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, here's the thing. If they're not testing their, their semen production prior to starting, we don't know where they were to begin with. What if right. what if they were azospermic and didn't produce any sperm? True. True. Right. Of course, they're going to blame testosterone. And every yeah. doctor they see is going to go, oh, that testosterone did it. <laughs> if you don't know, the, right. the answer is you don't know. Right. So, I, you know, when, when I have somebody who's, you know, of, of reproductive age and, and that might be an issue, you know, we're pushing, hey, let's do a semen analysis and and maybe do some banking of that in the event that something goes haywire, right. you've got something in reserve, right? right. right. Uh, you know, but yeah, you're, you know, using high dose HCG, I can, for myself, um, I did, I was, you know, been on anabolics from when I was a power lifter in my 20s right. and then been in HRT, very similar, you know, um, I did a, a semen analysis and I made less uh, less than 900,000 swimmers, which is not good. Yeah. Um, I got on high dose HCG, like 2,000 units, three times a week. Yeah. And I turned that up to 160 million. So, you know, yeah. it works. And I'm I, have, yeah, I have a I'm protocol with old, so. Yeah, I have a protocol with HCG, HMG, um, Clomid, and, you know, um, injectable glutathione that seems to work every single time with when it I does use it works it. phenomenal yeah. yeah and so you could it's you know there's there's certain science the great thing about the endocrine system it is very resilient but like you said i, I it's like the people who take like like a dose of thyroid hormone to lose weight and then when they stop taking it they gain all this weight back and they say the thyroid ruined their the, the, the thyroid you know replacement ruined their thyroid well they never checked their thyroid before they started they probably were hypo to begin with and they didn't even know it and then when they took it, they restored their body to normal. And then they stopped it. And they went back to being hypo again. Of course, they're going to gain back the weight. So Yeah. You know, and there's one, one last point, you know, that you yeah. made is kind of like your years of experience, Dom's years of experience. And how, you know, how long has, you know, bodybuilders been involved in, you know, using hormones, right? Since the yeah. 60s or before that. Yeah. And so for these youngsters to come out and go, oh, it's this, you know, listen, there's, it's maybe not written down. We haven't done studies on these bodybuilders, but you know, they've 
been out there in the trenches doing this as you know as mice themselves, treating themselves <laughs> as lab rats, right. but getting great results and figuring it out. Like, right. Yeah. And so with all of these years and the bro science behind it, honestly, a lot of that bro science is coming back and we're looking at it, doctors and now studying it and going, it works. Right. Right. Not everything, but a lot of it is and you're going, all right, right, there's something to this. I mean, you know, we can't do the, the human studies. But if humans are out there doing the studies on themselves, you might want to just listen a little. Yeah, bit. You know what happens? These 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 TikTokers and these these self proclaimed gurus they find a study because they love to search studies online now. So they find a study that has no relevance to bodybuilding or at all. They take people who don't work out, who don't eat right, who and they and they and they put them on something for like a week, and then they test muscle mass and stuff like that, or. You know, and then they apply that to like the the, the workout bodybuilder. It's just it's not applicable. It 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 doesn't have transference just because they're using the word androgen receptor and testosterone doesn't it has any relevance to a person who works out and eats six times a day and and trains and takes that. And and so yes, they're quoting a study, but no, the study's not relevant to the situation. Yeah, I mean the a thing too that I see it drives me nuts. Um, that I'll see like even these guys that are like chiropractors that are now getting into like the YouTube <laughs> space and they'll put something out. I seen the other day that they were saying that, you know, if your kid eats uh, cereal or frosted flakes, they're going to get, get cancer. Now, when you look at the actual study, cause I did look at it. Don't quote me on this. I think it was um, uh, BTH, which is a preservative. I, yeah. I think that it was either that or another preservative, whatever, but yeah. The amount of frosted flakes that you would need to eat before <laughs> you would have a chance of having carcinogenic cells was yeah. 11,000 boxes of frosted flakes. Now, I'm not saying that frosted flakes are great to eat for breakfast every day, right, no, right, right. but to make that claim, and they're saying that too because they're doing it in a mice study where no one would be able to eat 1,100 boxes of, right, of cereal right. a day, but they're going on there and they're using these scare tactics when they should really be listening to people. Like, you know, the question I asked about to Dr. Pierce about women on testosterone, ask someone that's been doing this and worked with thousands of patients and seen it firsthand. Those are the people I would listen to than someone that read a, a rat study on something that is really not applicable to humans. Right. Well, you know, oranges contain formaldehyde, but in very in how many of them would you have to eat? amounts that you're not going to die from eating an orange obviously. apple seeds contain cyanide right yeah right. there you go right so you know it's you know to dom's point too 80 80 to 90 percent of rodent studies do not cross over to humans no so, you know and i hear all this rodent studies when i read a rodent study i throw it away i got yeah. okay tell me when it's a, a person yeah. You know, and I've heard doctors going, well, we've proven that it didn't. Like, oh, that's why. And I've never heard that. And so I go, look at it. It was a freaking mouse study. And I'm like, right, I, I right, got out of your right. mind. And then yeah. they're on the podcast as the expert. And you're like, oh, okay. Everyone, you know what? And nowadays, everyone's got a podcast. Everyone's an expert. And that's what that's I, and it, and it drives me a little crazy because people watch all the wrong things that they shouldn't be watching. And, and that's where they get all their information from, unfortunately. Hey, guys, thank you so much for joining us. And I know you guys got to get back to work. I can't wait to come out to the clinic and come in there and get all my tests done. And so looking forward to it. We'll, we'll be back with it. We have a lot more topics that Dom and I laid out. So we're going to do another one of these probably the next week or the week after. And I know the, uh, our audience is really loving it. So thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having us on. All right, guys, that's going to take us to the other end of another episode of Guru Talk. I'm Dave Palumbo with Don Batasio and Dr. John Pierce. See you next time.